Hi, good morning and uh, good evening to people who are in South Asia. Uh, I'm Mina Hewitt, the Executive Director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard. I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the sponsors of today's uh, workshop, which is a series of three workshops that will be hosted on Saturdays um, from 10.30 to 11.45 on September 12th, which is today, October 3rd and October 24th. Our sponsors are Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, Kabul University, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard and the Mittal Institute. And today's uh, topic is extreme urbanism, a view on Afghanistan. And it's broken up into three series, as I mentioned. It's a very unique time, not just because we are in this pandemic and we are all on Zoom. I think we've all sort of gotten used to now communicating with each other and continuing our work. But what's truly unique about today's workshop or the series that Rahul and his team have designed is that it's on Afghanistan and particularly they're looking at interesting urban issues on the border of Tajikistan and the province of Badakhshan. And you'll hear more about it during the course of these series. This workshop is also truly unique because it's opened up to a broader audience, which is what, again, this pandemic has sort of brought uh, as an opportunity for us is to involve people who otherwise it would have been difficult to bring uh, to the US. Um, because uh, of this broad audience and the larger participation, the topic is going to be able to cover very complex issues related to contemporary architecture, as well as juxtaposing it with historical settlements in urban environments in Afghanistan. It's also going to look at infrastructure, it's going to look at public policy, it's going to look at cultural reflections and how that's reflected in the built environment. So as you can see, it is going to be rich with all kinds of complex issues in an area that often, I don't think we've ever, uh, Rahul uh, can attest to that, covered this area in the studio. So these series are also going to inform the studio that the design studio that is being offered this fall at the design school. And it'll allow us to bring uh, experience and information from, again, practitioners, faculty members from Kabul University, academics across Harvard, um, and also students are involved uh, from Afghanistan in this particular project. So again, in many ways, it's truly a unique opportunity. So very quickly, I'd like to introduce Rahul, uh, who has been sort of the mastermind behind uh, this, this uh, series of uh, workshops as well as the studio. Rahul uh, has over 30, maybe 40 years, depending on you know, if he started as a teenager, uh, experience in architecture and planning. He's done a lot of writing and teaching on issues uh, in architecture, urban design, as well as conservation. He's an educator as well as a practicing architect and an urban designer, has offices in Boston and in Mumbai. Um, some of his interesting projects, and actually they straddle both contemporary as well as conservation work that he has done, for example, the master plan for the Taj Mahal or the restoration of several heritage buildings in India. And his more recent projects include a library for the School of Architecture at SEPT in Ahmedabad, the School of Public Policy at IIM Ahmedabad, and their building on faculty and arts and sciences. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Rahul to open the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meena. Uh, thanks very much for those kind words and the introduction. And thank you to the Lakshmi Mittal South Asia Institute, to yourself, Chelsea and Rafi for supporting this. Um, really, it is unique because both within the South Asia Institute and the GSD, we've not looked at Afghanistan and learned from Afghanistan. So thank you for your support. Thank you also for, to everyone for being part of this, uh, to logging in. 
uh, it's just really nice to have a broader conversation on Afghanistan. And as Mina said, this is, this is a three-part series on architecture and urbanism in Afghanistan. And we are starting today with very broad issues of planning. Uh, and then we'll look at traditional architecture and urbanism. And then finally, we'll look at contemporary architecture and urbanism uh, in Afghanistan. This idea actually originated because it's part of an option studio uh, that my colleague Charlotte Matabath, who um, is with us uh, and uh, will also moderate the second session on traditional architecture and urbanism. The two of us, as we were planning the studio in Afghanistan, which itself was a challenge, uh, were going to have a number of lectures embedded just for the students to be exposed to much broader issues. But then I think in conversations, we decided that it would make sense to aggregate these in these workshops on Saturday morning so that a much broader audience could, could avail of this conversation on Afghanistan. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, you know, the series were born in a sense uh, with the support of the South Asia Institute. Uh, the studio itself, as uh, Mina has pointed out, is in the northeastern sort of corner almost of Afghanistan, um, which uh, it which borders that which is on the border of Tajikistan. Uh, and um, what we are going to, of course, discuss in the series is much more broad, uh, looking at Afghanistan more holistically. Uh, I hope, uh, and uh, it's been fantastic because we've been supported. Uh, in this case by the Al Khan Agency for Habitat, uh, who are working on the ground there, but also the Al Khan uh, Trust for Culture, uh, Kabul University through the Al Khan uh, Agency for Habitat has become a partner. And what is very interesting is we also have in parallel uh, eight or 10 students at Kabul University partnering with our students to work on the ground. So it also becomes an exposure to both sets of students as collaborations. Uh, and I hope some of them are also logged in. Uh, the second session, many uh, professors from Kabul University will also participate uh, in these uh, proceedings. In Afghanistan for the last four or five decades, I mean, the condition has been really challenging. I mean, I don't need to frame that. It might emerge in the discussion, but in this process of rebuilding, reconstructing, uh, upgrading, uh, it's been a whole range of actors uh, that have been involved in partnership with the government. And these are of course, external agencies like the World Bank, USAID, from different countries. I think there's lots of ties with Japan. They're NGOs, both national and international, and or rather internal and external. And then there's civil society, which is citizens, the university, which plays a big role. And I think what is fascinating about Afghanistan and this whole process of, of rebuilding, upgrading, developing, uh, is that these partnerships um, uh, are setting up interesting new models uh, by which capacity, know-how, uh, but also, um, uh, uh, also kind of looking at the locality uh, more rigorously uh, can occur. And so what we are trying to do in this series is kind of represent uh, people from all those areas so that we get voices uh, that um, uh, speak to uh, looking at the problems and solutions from these different perspectives. I mean, not only do we think it would be a great exposure for our students to be able to listen to those voices to understand this, uh, but these become ideal forums and platforms where often these disparate agencies don't have a, a, a framework to have these discussions. So for us, uh, I think this is a very important beginning and thank you again to the Institute for supporting this. Today, we have um, two sets of presentations. The first one is going to be from Ono Rol, who is the general manager of the Al Khan Agency for Habitat. He's going to start off. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that his background has been with the World Bank. Uh, and I, I just highlight that only because our next presentation is going to be a World Bank pro, uh, sponsored presentation. But Ono now wears another hat, which is he is helping establish a very young uh, part of the Aga Khan network, which is the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, which was expressively set up to look at broader planning questions, to look at rural habitats, uh, to look at the relationship between uh, planning processes and port protocols, both in the urban and the rural. So therefore to look nationally more holistically. Uh, and so he has been setting up this sort of effort and work on the ground there uh, and has 
uh, amazing experience in, in, in doing this through his experience in the World Bank, where he was based in India. Uh, he was heading the portfolio there, so it's very familiar with South Asia. Uh, and so we'll start with Ono's presentation. And our next presenter presenters is actually a team from Sasaki, uh, many of whom, uh, you know, well, they're based in Boston, so, and they have great intersections with the GSD, where we are doing the studio. Many of them were students uh, in both in the urban design, landscape programs, planning programs. But Dennis Pipers, who kind of leads this team, uh, has also been a graduate from the, from the School of Design um, and in, engaged with the School of Design and teaching there periodically. Uh, Dennis uh, has um, about 40 years of experience. Uh, he was the youngest partner at Sasaki, uh, a firm again based here in Boston, and has been for the last four or five years with the team that we see here leading an initiative in Afghanistan to not only plan for Kabul, but also look at other five other towns around the ring road, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, Dennis's experience uh, over these years, I think will be incredibly valuable. So will the rest of his team. Uh, I will leave it to Dennis to introduce the teammates as they come on. Uh, and with that, I'm going to invite Ono to share with us uh, what they're thinking about planning uh, in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Um, it's uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to be um, uh, to be in this seminar, which, uh, from our perspective, couldn't be more beautifully um, named. Um, just checking that you guys can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, that worked. Um, so, so um, uh, why is the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat? First, uh, thank you, first of all, to the Lakshmi Mittal Institute, Harvard, Kabul University, our colleagues from the Trust for Culture. Why is a new agency from the Aga Khan Network uh, working on extreme urbanism? Well, first, a little bit of context um, on uh, this is where we work. So it looks pretty extreme if you if you try to fit urbanism to the pictures that that you see there. The Aga Khan Development Network, first, very briefly, is a is is a network that was created by His Highness the Aga Khan 50 years ago, um, more than 50 years ago, has 96,000 uh, staff members, employees, uh, not counting volunteers, mainly working in South and Central Asia and Africa, also in Europe and, um, and uh, presence in North America. And it is not a denominational institution. It's uh, based on the principles of pluralism, uh, solidarity, consultation, self-reliance, and human dignity, and and that is why people like me, who who are not at all from the Ismaili community, can be agency heads in in this in this network. It is a truly non-denominational, very visionary network, and I have to say it was great to work at the World Bank, but it's fantastic to work in a network that aims to be much closer to people. In the World Bank, I often felt I was closer to governments. Um, it's a network also that doesn't just have development, which is in the middle of this slide, as social development institutions, where you see at the right bottom our Agency for Habitat. It also has economic development, which basically means businesses, and then it has the trust for culture. Uh, what is especially exciting uh, to, to many of us is to work in a network that combines social development and business, because we often struggle just doing business in developing countries because it's difficult to do this in a way that makes one feel that there is participation and true improvement of the quality of life for the people who work in those businesses. Yet when we work on social development, we often struggle realizing that our efforts can't be sustainable because the only truly sustainable uh, forms of activity are those that, uh, that earn revenue. Our network combines these two. Now, the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, as Rahul mentioned, is, is a completely new agency. It is, however, not uh, new in the sense that it is a startup. It is actually a merger of two parts of the network that existed before. One is an agency that was called, and still is called in, uh, in North America, Focus Humanitarian, which essentially uh, focused on community-based disaster resilience in a fairly advanced way, which is where the link to planning will come in. And the other is the Aga Khan Planning and Building Services, which worked exclusively in India and Pakistan, which were an incarnation of, um, of the Ismaili housing boards there. And their mandate traditionally was to think about housing for communities, how to build that, how to provide for it. And ultimately that rolled into thinking about how to plan for housing. Now, His Highness um, 
realize that um, in the areas where we work and the core areas where the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat works are South and Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Tajikistan, India primarily, and since uh, since a short while ago, also Syria. We will roll out operations also in East Africa with time. He realized that the approach of community-based community -based disaster resilience was still very necessary, but that the risk the communities faced was exacerbating, getting worse quite rapidly. And that, um, and, and this, of course, is significantly as a consequence of the risk profiles changing due to climate change, particularly in high mountain areas, which are quite prevalent in the geographies that we're talking about. And he therefore thought that it was no longer going to be possible to keep people safe uh, trying to do the same things as were done before simply by mobilizing communities and have them understand their localized risks because those risks themselves are changing. He also felt that other than having more technologically advanced solutions to risk mitigation, it was really important that um, the understanding of risk, which had been going on for 25 years, since 25 years, focus had been mapping the actual direct hazard risk in more than 2000 communities in the geographies that I'm talking about, which literally means going there every three years, sending geologists, working with the communities, looking at every hill slope, using satellite data and understanding how this works and building that into a very big GIS uh, database uh, with detailed risk mapping that um, a intellectual capital had been created that might be part of the solution to the problem of how you deal with the risk profile changing due to climate change. Because in effect, the people in the high mountains of the Himalayas, the Pamirs, Karakoram um, uh, mountains are living at the frontier, the battlefront of climate change, just as much as the people of the Maldives or, or the people in low-lying coastal areas in Bangladesh. They are threatened actively and directly by climate change impact on their habitat. And they are right there. They live right at the edge. The people leave, live almost as far up as, um, as virtually every uh, animal, maybe with the exception of snow leopards. And, and, and therefore they're right there. So the logic of combining the planning engineering capacity of the Aga Khan planning and building services and the humanitarian and disaster resilience capacity of focus humanitarian was that by using the data in this GIS database, by understanding the risk and mapping it, it should be possible not just to plan for survival as we did in the past, but actually plan for populations to thrive. And His Highness put this in a very beautiful way. He said that planning shouldn't be about what things are, it should be about what things ought to be. And therefore, um, he exhorted us to go to a much more ambitious approach, a much more uh, uh, radical approach, not just thinking about how to help communities survive. And here are some of the, uh, the, the things we do uh, in terms of numbers, glacier monitoring, community-based weather monitoring post, 30,000 volunteers on the ground who are the first responders when there is a disaster. We built water and sanitation systems for well over half a million people. We built more than 50,000 homes uh, and 5,000 schools, hospitals, and community centers. Now, what do you do with all that knowledge, with the database that has the risk mapping? You can use that to combine our ability to engage with the community. And this is really important. For those of us, I lived in North America for a long time. When a hurricane comes, typically the biggest challenge that authorities have is not to predict a hurricane. Uh, it is to convince people to respond to the hurricane and to heed the warnings that they're given. Um, I, countless times I've seen people on the outer banks in the Carolinas on TV saying, I'll ride out the storm with a six pack. Our agency, engages with every community on a regular basis, at least twice a year, to talk about their understanding of risks. 
This allows uh, these uh, people in the community who are first responders to engage with individuals in that community about how they should respond when a risk materializes and the next step, where they might build, where they might build their homes, where they might build their community centers, where they might build their schools, how they might maintain their infrastructure. In other words, how they plan for their community. Now, today we're talking about Afghanistan and this for me is truly exciting um, because uh, we've been trying to um, to do knowledge collaboration with institutions like Harvard for a long time and we've been by and large successful but we've never been successful to work in places like Afghanistan there's a very simple reason for that uh, the, the classic model of working in studios is that students and faculty need to go to the country where they work to actually be exposed and interact with the community and understand what's going on and that's of course a great model Model, but it's unfortunately not a viable model for Afghanistan. So when um, Kira Intertor, who was our head for habitat planning, was reaching out to Rahul about uh, wanting to work now, we suddenly realized that uh, COVID, bad as it is, provided a tremendous opportunity for us to use a different way we're now working, to work in areas where we could normally not work. Because suddenly it became acceptable to work purely virtually, purely remote. Uh, typically, we would work with a university only in Tajikistan or India, and we have worked with Rahul in India actually before, um, but, uh, but not in Pakistan because most university faculty and students are not allowed to go there, definitely not in Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, now we've actually decided to focus on first Afghanistan and hopefully next year, Syria. Um, what's our challenge in Afghanistan? Well, Afghanistan is as um, at risk from natural disaster and climate change as any high mountain area. And Afghanistan is largely a high mountain area. And the northeastern corner of uh, Afghanistan, uh, Badakhshan and Baglan are very, very mountainous areas. They're very far away, far flung, and the communities there really struggle to survive on the battlefront of climate change. These people get displaced by floods, rock slides, mudslides, avalanches on a regular basis. On top of that, they get displaced by violence, uh, man-made risks. And therefore, in Afghanistan, we see even more issues with people being either temporarily or for the long term displaced. And then, as all of you no doubt know, there's a large number of people who have fled Afghanistan over the years, who eventually, inshallah, as we would say, at some point might uh, want to come home. Now, when you think about that, you actually realize that Afghanistan is a place where extreme urbanism is extremely necessary. First of all, we need to help those high mountain communities plan for what ought to be, plan for an opportunity to thrive, not just be marginal and just manage to scrape by and survive. This requires a totally different outlook, an outlook uh, that, that Switzerland took on its mountains a very, very long time ago, thinking not how do I just manage, but how do I actually do well in mountains? And that may sound ambitious, but I want to point out that any European you asked 200 years ago whether Switzerland would be rich would laugh at you because Switzerland was extremely marginal by virtue of the fact that it was a mountainous and still is a mountainous country. So when you have a long-term horizon on development, planning for communities in the high mountains of Afghanistan to actually thrive and have opportunities for the next generation is a long-term investment that will pay off. It will not pay off next year immediately, but it will pay off bit by bit by bit. And the vision behind our agency is that we use the knowledge of engaging with these communities and the technical geological uh, knowledge and the GIS database we have to do exactly that. Then, obviously, not everybody stays in these high uh, mountain villages. People go to urban centers, um, essentially down the valley. In those urban centers, there's a tremendous need for uh, looking at planning again. Demographies have really changed. They have changed as a consequence of conflict. Um, people move in. Um, they tend to want to move closer to urban areas. Some people have moved out altogether. There are temporary residents who become long term. These uh, communities have really changed because of what happened on the ground in Afghanistan. And um, 
Afghanistan is the kind of country where for at least 20 years, nobody has thought about how you solve a problem like that because everybody is focused on the short term. What we are trying to do with the Trust for Culture, our partners from, from Kabul University and, and, and now hopefully the, of certainly the knowledge input from, 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 the, from the, the, the wherewithal that, that Harvard and other academic partners might bring to us, is to start thinking about how you can actually rebuild these communities plan for their new demography, their new role in the economy and do that um, ambitiously, but of course with an implementation on the ground that matches the, the ground reality also in terms of security. And then there is in Afghanistan the big prize, which is Kabul. Kabul has become much bigger because strange as it may sound for all of us who read about bomb blasts in Kabul uh, on a regular basis, uh, for many people in Afghanistan, Kabul is still the safest place where they can be, actually for most people. So Kabul has seen great influx of people. And at the same time, of course, many people have left uh, because of the combination between local um, um, migration and uh, refugee um, movements. Now, we don't know what will happen on the refugee side, but certainly the aspiration of everybody who um, who has good intentions for Afghanistan, including the government of Afghanistan for sure, is that some of the refugees who left Afghanistan will come back to help build a, a better country. But even before that is the case, we need to start thinking about urban planning for Kabul that actually helps Kabul become a much better place where people have a much better life, which we believe will help to stabilize in the community and lowering the risk of what we call man-made disaster. Um, so, so, so that is a, um, a, a big issue in working there. We, we would like to um, learn from our extensive experience in India and Pakistan, working in, uh, in urban um, environments, truly urban environments, building housing that uh, isn't just a roof over the head, but actually the kind of housing that allows people to build a better life, be ambitious, but also do it, uh, as one says in India, with a healthy dose of jugar, not in the sense of engineering, but in the sense of putting it together in a way that doesn't cost uh, an absolute fortune for each house because that won't be possible and therefore we need to innovate we need to innovate in Kabul we need to innovate in district centers and we need to innovate in the places that are at the beginning of my presentation that don't look like urbanism at all in fact they look like almost empty space with a bit of infrastructure but a girl who gets born in those places should have the same opportunities in our life as a girl who is born anywhere in the world and technology actually makes that possible. So our dream and our ambition and our job is to work to bring to bear the knowledge that allows us to develop urbanism in the most extreme locations in the world when we think of urbanism and planning as that what makes the built environment not just safe but supportive of opportunity for the people who live there and that is why we are so excited to be in this in this um, in this series that we're so excited to participate with Rahul and 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 the other partners in the workshops we really look forward to what we'll all learn from it and hopefully many more times to come because there'll be years of work and learning to find a way to meet this challenge. Uh, let me stop there. Um, uh, if I can find a way to unshare my screen, um, then I'd like to uh, head, hand the floor back to, I guess, Rahul. Uh, somebody unshared my screen for me. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ono. Thank you very much for actually stating the challenges uh, in their broader sense. And I think the idea of uh, planning serving not just survival, but how people can thrive uh, is, I think, a very well kind of articulated uh, uh, challenge and mission in a sense. So thank you very much for that. We'll come back to the questions. But before we go to Dennis, there was one question that came on the screen, which I just want to address before we move on, which was, 
that was in the context of the studio we're doing is what is the connection we have to the district and Badashan and how will we you know, get that data? And I just want to whoever asked that question, uh, there are two or three levels we are doing that at. One is we're working through uh, the Agency for Habitat who have people on the ground. Uh, we've already through the summer had many meetings with uh, stakeholders, which are even government and uh, district officials to understand their perspective. And now with the help of Kabul University, Kabul University students, we are going to actually reach out at other kinds of stakeholders so that we get a much finer grain of feedback to the extent we can uh, using the virtual mode. Uh, and we are confident that with all the partners in place, which is why the collaboration is so important, that we'd get as good a pulse as we possibly can with the limitations we have. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dennis and the team from Sasaki, who will now kind of maybe respond to some of the things that uh, Ono has brought up through their own experiences. Uh, so with that, Dennis, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ali Khan will share our screen. Uh, thank you, Raul. Thank you, Ono. Uh, thank you for including us in this exciting studio uh, with the GSD and the Institute. Um, let's make sure my... Okay. Okay. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the team here. Um, we will talk primarily about our experience in five provincial cities that we uh, worked on with the World Bank. Uh, and I will do a brief introduction that will show a bit of our work in Kabul. Uh, but my colleagues, uh, Ali Khan, Thomas, Ainat, and Victor will talk about these themes and uh, primarily focused on uh, our work on the five cities. Um, we first became involved in Afghanistan through a recommendation from a colleague in the Philippines to a senior advisor to President Ghani. And uh, out of that uh, came a discussion with the president directly. And he said that uh, he wanted to improve the lives of ordinary citizens that the wars uh, had uh, obviously uh, uh, presented a gigantic distraction from just how people cope uh, with life uh, in the city. And uh, he asked us to develop a framework for the city. And uh, he articulated a bold vision uh, that he had a, a kind of a way of thinking. And this is uh, one of our framework drawings that uh, came out of that process. But uh, we had many engagements with uh, uh, various entities, including uh, President Ghani himself, uh, uh, bi-monthly, uh, besides our weekly Skype calls with a range of city and uh, uh, institutional partners. Um, his uh, contributions were incredibly inspiring uh, and engaging. Uh, we, uh, as Ono noted, very difficult to travel there, although one of our part colleagues did travel there, one of our infrastructure experts based in New York. But we formed a broad coalition of partners, everything from uh, uh, Kabul University, various ministries, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, Turquoise Mountain, and various individuals based in Kabul and uh, beyond. Uh, and that was incredibly helpful. Uh, we had a series of workshops many uh, via Zoom, but also in person in Dubai. The work began uh, looking at a broad array of issues. Uh, and these evolved as we uh, uh, did our work. Uh, we looked through many lenses uh, at the city, trying to understand it. It was a huge learning experience. 
And out of that, we developed a series of key drivers dealing with big issues that uh, we felt uh, working with uh, uh, the partners uh, to address. And uh, you can see, I'm not gonna go through them, but uh, they became uh, major uh, ways for us of thinking about the city and uh, its uh, urban form. We also took a very systematic approach. It was, as you can imagine, very complex to uh, find data and then to use that data to map information in easily accessible ways. It was clear that we had, this was a project about regeneration, about building on the existing city and uh, guiding investment in a strategic way. We developed uh, a series of design-led uh, concepts that would address uh, the, the issues uh, developed in the drivers, and uh, they cover a wide range of issues, uh, as you can see here. And one of the critical approaches we did was to work with the existing structure of the city. This wasn't about cutting new boulevards through uh, urban fabric, it was to work with what was there. And these corridors of commercial and civic life became drivers for uh, a big bus transit system and economic uh, investment. We were asked to focus on two particular ones, Darulaman Boulevard and uh, Masood Boulevard, uh, which you can see here. And uh, we drilled into them both, uh, focusing on the transit investment, focusing on public land uh, that could become catalysts for development uh, and investment. Uh, this is just one diagram that represents some of the infrastructure work that uh, was constantly being addressed, not only for the specific corridors, but the city as a whole, water, energy, uh, all of the, the elements that uh, one needs to uh, think about. The transit uh, uh, idea was uh, uh, focused on uh, uh, creating catalysts for investment. So on this publicly owned uh, very large parcel, we proposed a mixed use uh, development that connected a neighborhood to Darulaman uh, and the transit. And we tried to show how one might build in this uh, scenario in a way that was appropriate for the city, but was forward looking. Uh, in defining that future that uh, I think the Aga Khan stated so well. Another district uh, building on uh, Bagi Babur, which was a major uh, initiative of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture to restore that garden on publicly owned land uh, near the Kabul Zoo. We created a whole array of community places, uh, recreation, uh, sports, uh, and uh, other elements that would provide uh, uh, places for people to uh, live a better life in the city. On Masood, uh, we again focused on publicly owned land and the development of transit and other infrastructure uh, on the hillsides next to Masood, another large area of our uh, activity on the informal housing sector. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much, but other than to say we developed strategies to uh, uh, invest in infrastructure and community facilities. And uh, you can see in this diagram how we started to integrate the hillside development with new transitional housing, affordable housing, public markets right on uh, Masood, uh, which you see on the bottom right. 
uh, here you see uh, in front of one of the transit stations, a, a new market, a mosque, and the hillside housing connected to this new public space uh, with higher densities along the uh, boulevard. All of this led to uh, our work with the World Bank and uh, the focus on five cities, five regional provincial capitals. Uh, this was a very different uh, process for us and a very exciting evolution of our work in Afghanistan and Kabul. And here you see a map of the country and uh, just the basic structure of the team. This time the team became much more uh, broad. Uh, we had a number of partners uh, who worked with us on the ground. A number of them were based in Kabul and uh, in terms of uh, engagement, in terms of social development, engineering, infrastructure, and our main client contact by the World Bank was the Ministry of Urban Development and Land, IDLG, and the various uh, entities in each city. We were charged with developing strategic frameworks for each city. These are not master plans. They are really about uh, prioritizing development, creating broad strategies for investment, and then identifying specific opportunities for implementation. We had a long and a carefully uh, fine-tuned uh, process that was iterative and built uh, on insights and input. A key aspect of this work was the outreach and the engagement uh, on the ground through surveys, focus groups, cutting across uh, a broad uh, aspect of society, uh, interviews, uh, and we were very much part of that, but also many individually held uh, in each city uh, by members of uh, Moodle and other uh, uh, Afghan entities. We also had an in-person workshop with key leaders from each city. And uh, uh, this was in Istanbul with the World Bank's participation. While all that was going on in parallel, we had a very deep uh, level of data-driven analysis, mapping, looking at data, gathering data as a way to uh, advance our understanding and knowledge of the five cities and their regions. Uh, we developed critical themes that uh, were informed by the data and the uh, engagement process. And these themes uh, were these, uh, that you see there, I won't go through them, but you can see that we drilled into each one uh, it, to uh, address uh, the issues that came out of those themes and into more specifics uh, in more detail. We developed a series of principles that uh, became, uh, that came out of all of the, this engagement, as well as our experience. And I won't describe these, but my colleagues will elaborate a bit uh, on these as we uh, show you more detail. So you can see the fairly broad areas of uh, thought that went into this work. The plan was very action oriented and implementation oriented. So it was not only to develop the frameworks, but to identify opportunities for investment, whether through the World Bank, through the, the Afghan government or other entities to help uh, improve the lives of uh, Afghan, Afghan citizens in these cities. 
And my last image here is uh, just from one of our uh, uh, calls with uh, President Ghani. Uh, you can see the kind of issues he was focused on, the long-term vision, the rules of the game. He constantly said, zoom in and zoom out. Uh, uh, always uh, look at the two uh, context and uh, the city itself. Look at the city as a system. Look for opportunities to leverage the advantages of each city. He wanted to unlock investment and generate jobs and employment. And he always emphasized the sense of urgency uh, and the need to coordinate across sectors. So with that, I will pass it on to Ali Khan, who will talk about uh, his piece. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, from the beginning, from our work in Kabul, all the way through our work on the five cities, the notion of Afghanistan as a historic and a contemporary crossroads of culture, of language, of economics, and politics has been central to our understanding of the country and its people. Um, as we know too well, the strategic location of Afghanistan on the front lines of geopolitics has meant decades of instability, but at the same time, its strategic location has been a huge strength. Um, for thousands of years, cities like Herat and Balkh have been hubs of international trade and culture. Um, whether Persian or Pashto, Muslim or Buddhist, each of Afghanistan's major cities has been the seat of empire at some stage of history. And what we, I think, really saw at every level was that these layers of history and culture have contributed to the country's incredibly diverse society, um, as well as um, economic potential and a wealth uh, in terms of built environment. And this, this idea of Afghan cities as hubs of international commerce and culture was one that President Ghani emphasized um, to us and what was, I think, especially inspiring and rewarding um, was the opportunity to dig between the challenges of, of conflict and instability and growth and infrastructure and, and really you know, focus on the incredible foundation that Afghanistan has. At the same time, um, with the strategic development frameworks in particular, um, we were tasked at looking at the nuts and bolts of economic development and infrastructure as well. And so while we were specifically looking at five of the, the country's largest cities, the emphasis was always on these cities as hubs of economic growth and culture um, and their position in the larger network of transportation um, and a system of cities and towns um, that are all interlinked. Uh, and our, our focus was really on um, not just planning for the people in these cities, but also understanding how are um, the investments and the systems that we looked at were part of really a broader vision of economic development and nation building. Um, so today, um, Afghanistan is still at the center of regional trade. And one thing, especially given the location of uh, Ishkashim, uh, that I think would be um, great to focus on and to do some background research on is, is understanding all of the, the different investments, whether those are pipelines, rail lines, connections. Um, every country around Afghanistan, from China to India to Turkmenistan, um, sees an opportunity um, and sees a potential connection to global trade. Um, and I think uh, understanding and leveraging this infrastructure is not only a way for Afghanistan to start to lead on the regional stage, but also a way to start kind of building uh, investment, right? So transitioning from international aid that is, you know, of course meant um, to build the country, but starting to look at investments that, um, that actually um, are, are made um, on Afghanistan's own terms and help, um, uh, um, help the country kind of uh, have a place uh, on the stage of international commerce. 
We also looked at the national network of cities and economic regions. Each of the five cities that we looked at are linked by a national ring road. Uh, and this, this chart shows essentially all of the regions that are within an hour and two hour travel times at the major cities. Um, and what is interesting is that in many cases, if you look at Herat, if you look at Mazar, if you look at Jalalabad, the connections with cities in neighboring countries are often just as strong as the connections um, or the, the transit connectivity to other cities within Afghanistan. And so this tells us two things. One is that creating uh, synergies and links uh, and thinking about those cross-border cities is very important, uh, but also strengthening those internal connections is key because each of these cities, um, as Thomas will speak to later, is in a different uh, ecological setting. They have different natural resources, different specialties, and by connecting them, um, there's a lot to gain. We also drilled down into the region around each city. And uh, the five cities that we looked at are, um, I think, representative of the fact that even though Afghanistan is, is known for a rugged um, and in some cases harsh climate, many of its cities are in lush agricultural valleys and they are the center of networks of smaller towns and villages. And making sure that there are connections, both in terms of um, you know, transporting people, but also transporting goods, um, looking at the water networks where the rivers that flow through these valleys feed the agriculture as well as the urban population is incredibly important. And then finally, we looked at connectivity on the city scale and we looked at how industry is structured around major highways, where, they, where this industry is in relation to the city's historic core and how the location and the influence of all of this economic development is influencing new growth. And so often you see um, from this example in Herat, um, industry and customs outside the historic core or the older city fueling um, urban growth and logistics. And so I won't go into the details, but again, another example of how we tried to look at um, economics, industry, urban growth, quality of life, history, uh, in the same view. And I think the, the connectivity was one way we looked at it. Understanding what is being traded, what is being produced um, was another aspect. Um, and so one of the things that we focused on was the idea of value chains. Um, the idea of taking raw products, whether agriculture or minerals, and thinking about how to, to build the infrastructure and the uh, industrial assets to um, convert them into, you know, um, packaged goods, clothes, textiles, etc., and then even further on, complex products. Um, so going back to international trade, um, one of the things that we were made aware of very early on is that Afghanistan imports much more than it exports. Um, it buys goods from its neighbors, and this is a trend that has actually been increasing. In relative uh, in in recent years, um, and I, I apologize for putting uh, a bunch of graphs and stats in front of you on a Saturday morning, but one of the really um, interesting things for me was actually being able to work with um, trained economists on this project and and sort of understand the implications of this. Um, so one one major point is that you can see the volume of imports is huge compared to the volume of exports. Um, and so that means Afghans are spending a lot more money importing products, even basic products uh, like agriculture. Um, even though um, Afghanistan has done a good job of focusing on um, fruit, grapes, processed food, uh, some of the you know, specialties um, that are unique around the world, uh, the country is still importing basic goods like wheat, flour, um, rice, potatoes, um, and so you may encounter, you know, opportunities for um, agricultural processing. And while it is important to focus on the exports, um, thinking about supporting local businesses and producing goods that Afghans uh, will use is also important. Um, 
investing in infrastructure is important, but investing in human capital is also really important. Um, and one another trend recently is that the value added per worker has gone down. Um, so training is very important to equip people um, to um, to participate in these industries. Another key factor, key insight that we noticed was that if you look at the gender distribution of workers by sector, there's actually a very high proportion of women in manufacturing. And this is right now driven by textiles, uh, by weaving um, and manufacturing. But um, I think it's important to note that um, that is potentially an opportunity when you're, whether you're thinking about equity or economic development. Um, and then finally, education is, is important and creating jobs is important. Afghanistan has an incredibly young population and the country will need to create almost 4 million new jobs by 2026 as the, um, the sort of today's youth uh, enter the market. So the challenge is finding the resources for education, for healthcare um, and opportunities. But the upside is that um, if this is done well, um, there will be uh, a young um, and, you know, um, workforce in the future. And then finally, in terms of um, people and human capital, um, security and stability is, is key. Um, one clear trend is that um, out of almost half of the population that has been displaced, almost everybody goes uh, to the larger cities, whether they are coming back from Europe or other countries in the region, or whether they're migrating from villages. Um, and so our focus has been to anticipate and accommodate this population growth, but especially looking at some of the smaller towns and villages, uh, an area of focus um, that will really help, um, you know, mitigate the challenges and, and build on the work in the larger cities is trying to understand how to create the economic opportunity and the stability to encourage people to stay, um, to return to and to invest in those smaller towns and cities. Um, and so I'm gonna transition quickly to uh, some of the principles and ideas that we, we worked through. Um, again, one key principle is really connecting rural and urban cities. A second was thinking about a 21st century economy. And I think, um, you know, the fact that we're all here from across the globe online is, is you know, indicative of the fact that um, whether you're in a small town or a major city, um, having access to ICT, having good internet um, can connect you with the whole world. Um, so focus on the basics, you know, agricultural processing, but also why not connect everybody in every town and village to um, high-speed internet and give them opportunities. Um, so for each city, we focused on um, district and city level plans, trying to align future urban growth with existing and proposed industrial centers. We looked to create um, catalytic regional economic actors, anchors, um, such as a exchange and convention center in Kabul, where um, regional producers and farmers can come and display their goods, find merchants um, and opportunities for export. Um, we also look to create smaller, um, replicable and scalable opportunities in neighborhoods. Uh, so for example, vocational training, um, agriculture, um, research and development, libraries, uh, women's centers, um, to, to really try and invest in human capital, not just at universities, but for even the most um, vulnerable and marginalized communities. And then finally, we look to create um, urban rural gateways. Um, so this, these could be agro-processing centers or smaller nodes at the outskirts of towns that interface with the outlying uh, villages and towns um, that give um, people from towns the ability to come in, to trade, to sell their wares, but also um, to build some capacity while they're there, perhaps um, see a clinic, learn something new, um, et cetera. Um, and I think to, to kind of close with this, um, we, we went from the international scale down to the, the scale of the site um, and we proposed very specific projects. And a big takeaway is that many of these projects, some of them came from us, many of them were a result of the stakeholder consultation, 
many of them have already been proposed by other ministries um, and sort of um, government organizations or international organizations. And I think as you start to think about concrete proposals, um, it would be really important to, to look around to see what other ministries, other stakeholders are proposing. Um, and, and sort of as, um, um, as designers and planners to try and be the, the glue that coordinates um, all of these investments and, and puts them in a larger system. Um, so with that, um, I think, um, again, emphasizing uh, that connection with the urban and the rural, I'll turn it over to Thomas, who's gonna speak to landscape and ecology. Afghanistan's population is rapidly growing and with it, its agricultural and industrial economy. A major challenge in sustaining this growth is the increasing demand for natural resources, such as uh, portable water, the production of energy and food. This in return increases land requirements to accommodate the anticipated growth. Cities and city regions are confronted with the task to carefully and strategically plan for this urban expansion in order to not compromise the natural environment. To guide the government with this complex and interdisciplinary task, we introduced landscape and ecology as an integral part of city planning and urban development. Let's see, is it advanced? Yeah. In this presentation, oh, it still lacks a bit, Alika, maybe you have to go up to the second slide and guide me. Sure. In this presentation, I'm going to frame the story of Afghanistan through the lens of landscape and ecology and discuss the five cities initiatives through the notion um, of resilience to create connections between this project and the planning uh, and the design studio. I want to lead with the question, why does a landscape approach in Afghanistan city planning matter? I will try to answer this question by discussing some of the fundamental challenges and opportunities in Jalalabad the capital uh, city of Nangarhar province. Next slide. The initial phase of the five cities project involves the gathering analysis and interpretation of environmental data. Afghanistan's complex tectonic history belongs to one of the world's most diverse geology. These geologic processes uh, in return tell us a great deal about the country's climate, its hydrological river system that shaped the land and explains how the deposition of alluvium and fan alluvium allowed different cultural societies to establish a variety of livelihoods. Perhaps the most critical resource is water. Next slide. Afghanistan is situated at a relatively high elevation, which means it does not receive water from neighboring countries. Next slide. The province depends, the provinces depend on water supply from seasonal precipitation in the form of rain and snowfall. However, Due to a change in climate, Afghanistan has seen changes in annual precipitation in recent years with less snow packs. There's a famous Afghan saying that captures the true value of water. Let Kabul be without gold, but not without snow. The flow of water also identifies the country's terrestrial ecoregions. Ecoregions offer a framework to determine the existing biodiversity, identify families of plant species that might be considered for afforestation efforts, and recognize historic patterns of vegetation. This is critical in promoting natural resource management that supply livelihoods. Next slide. Agriculture plays an important role in Afghan livelihoods. While agriculture occupies more than 80% of the country's population, agriculture itself is at a crossroad. Next slide. The rural population has doubled. Access to arable land is shrinking and the younger generation is less inclined to stay on the farm and move to nearby cities. Livelihood zoning map is a concept that offers an alternative analytical unit that considers labor, livelihood, and market dynamics beyond provinces or districts. Each zone is linked to a specific livelihood profile, providing a better understanding of income across regions and the seasonality of agricultural production. Livelihood profiles also provide, a, provide an understanding of how climate change will affect different societies. Next slide. Effects of climate change influence 
the growth of urban agglomerations. While a big influx of people is associated, associated with returnees um, from national and international movement, many rural communities move into cities as the urban rural network does not provide access to markets or environmental disasters uh, like drought affect agricultural livelihoods in the more rural areas. The link between livelihoods and ecoregions can be understood as a potential for economic opportunities with an alternative resource management regime. Next slide. In sum, uncoordinated rapid growth puts a strain on the natural environment through an increase in demand for uh, natural resources on the one hand, but also higher outputs on effluents with the risk of contamination. This metabolic process results in increasing health threats and the city's ability to react to shock. Next slide. Afghanistan is prone to natural disasters because of its rugged terrain and cl uh, arid climate. Most major cities are located along snow-fed rivers and valleys surrounded by steep hills. Most cities are exposed and vulnerable to four major natural hazards, including floods, earthquakes, landslides, and droughts. The maps here illustrate a matrix describing the potential of social and economic impacts on either spectrum. Next slide. Disaster prevention and building resilience requires a combination of structural and non-structural solutions. Structural strategies include infrastructural physical solutions. Non-structural, on the other hand, um, involve strategies um, for social solutions such as early warning systems or disaster preparedness. Through the lens of landscape and ecology, resilience in the context of Afghanistan primarily addresses environmental resource management and risk mitigation with the goal to A, reduce the actual hazard, B, reduce the exposure to hazard, and C, reduce the vulnerability and increase people's adaptive capacity. Next slide. The first approach to guide urban growth was established with the development of a rapid landscape assessment model. This high-level tool computes landscape values, environmental risk, and sensitivity to water resources against the likeliness of future expansion based on expected population growth statistics. The result is a map that identifies areas of high ecological sensitivity that should um, be preserved or protected, development areas with high-risk exposure that can be mitigated, and areas with the potential for actual urban uh, development. The second approach resulted in the development of a landscape and ecology toolkit, next slide, that would address specific condition, uh, condi conditions identified in the rapid landscape assessment. Each toolkit identifies a set of landscape strategies that are particularly relevant to urban issues found within the city regions of the five provincial capital cities and identifies opportunistic design strategies to also strengthen the metropolitan park and open space system. Next slide. Before widespread uh, improvements can uh, be implemented to improve and manage uh, in the management of natural resources, standards based on best practices must be adapted for the Afghan context and translated into policies, regulations, and permitting. Furthermore, assisting government agencies to build capacity and establish mechanisms uh, to plan and implement uh, implementation are critical next steps. Next slide. Jalalabad lies at the confluence of the Kunar and the Kabul River Valley and is influenced by the region's abundant ridges and valleys. The city is an important regional food basket and economic hub between Kabul and Pakistan for many of the nearby agricultural valley towns. Jalalabad is relatively water and drought secure, but is exposed to higher degrees of flood and landslide risk. This diagram summarizes four main growth strategies that aim to accommodate an expected urban growth of 145%, which is equal to 200 to 350,000 people over the next 20 years. The four strategies include the development of a clear strategy to assess and manage the development pressure of new sharks, guide urban growth towards the south, incorporate remote residential settlements into the existing urban fabric, and reinvest into the city center to promote sustainable development along the Kabul River. Next slide. The core of the city is located along the southern Kabul River bank. This area is of great cultural significance because of the historic gardens and monuments, the commercial center, government facilities, and Abdul Haq. 
The major component lays in changing the city's relationship with the river. This diagram visualizes the potential for a landscape approach that connects ecology and culture into a vision that incrementally transcends down the river. Next slide. Abdul Haq uh, is an important public space that is under pressure from informal settlements. To preserve this cultural heritage as an open space and adapt to the exposure of higher water volumes during the spring in the future, the SDF proposes to redevelop Haq, uh, Abdul Haq into a multifunctional riverfront park. The focus here though is uh, the transformation of the existing flood wall into a multi-dimensional open space that responds to varying water levels and strengthens the relationship to the river by allowing specific access points. Uh, for example, people today are already swimming near Beshud Bridge, which is sort of seen in the background of this image. Next slide. This here is an image of Beshud Bridge, Beshud Bridge that connects the city center across Kabul River with the agricultural districts in the north and District 8. Next slide. District 8 is recognized as a peri-urban conglomerate consisting of incremental low rise and low density uh, development clusters with a high influx of returnees. Today, residents uh, migrate into the city center to pursue jobs, which can be very time consuming during rush hour. The municipality revealed intentions to develop a new public airport just north of District 8. This is an opportunity to position the district as a new gateway into the city and improve its resilience by providing better access to all sectors. A particular focus is given to the corridor when development nodes act as urban catalysts to provide strategic anchor facilities. Next slide. While providing access to social infrastructures and to the labor market provide one form of resilience, transforming the central drainage corridor as seen here on the right hand side uh, into a shared green infrastructure mitigates the exposure to environmental risk. Next slide. The envisioned drainage corridor as part of the district's blue-green network provide re provides residents with more recreational opportunities during dry season and protects them from flooding during heavy spring rains. Contour planting at the lower elevations of the hillside in the back protects settlements from landslide allow and allow uh, for future recreational opportunities linking the district with the Tangye Shaikan Regional Park. Next slide. This image here just looks beyond the hills of District 8 into the Tangye Shaikan Regional Park, where municipality considers the development of new sharks to accommodate future population growth. Last slide. Our work in Afghanistan is not meant to develop a static master plan, but to build uh, on the idea of flexible and dynamic planning tools that help municipalities to make informed decisions. Tools like the rapid landscape assessment, which is underlaid here with the government's expansion plan, is an initial planning tool meant to raise and fl uh, red flags when important ecosystems are being threatened by development and vice versa. Approaching planning in Afghanistan from a landscape perspective is crucial in how cities um, evaluate their carrying capacity define mechanisms to sustain themselves and adapt to the uh, environmental change. Thank you. I believe uh, next one will be Einat talking about the accessible city. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Einat Rosenkranz, an urban designer in Sasaki. Next slide, please. Um, the strategic frameworks for Afghan cities make clear from the beginning the importance of designing a city for all residents, where access to opportunities available for everyone. This city for all approach is essential for Afghanistan, Afghanistan's success, ensuring that residents will have the economic opportunity, education, and quality of life necessary for a thriving city. Women are at the center of this approach. This instruction that you see uh, in, in the screen came directly from President Ghani, and even though it wasn't part of the brief of the project, we made it a central piece of it. And while the strategies uh, for women empowerment well integrated in all aspects uh, uh, of our project, this section is intended to highlight just how critical it is to deliberately design for women in Cabo. Next. Uh, I'm sure that many of you uh, know the history of Afghanistan, but I just wanted to highlight uh, some moments in the timeline uh, regarding women. 
In the decades following Afghanistan independence, uh, Kabul was a vibrant cosmopolitan capital, capital where women participated eco economically, socially, and politically. In the 1920s, Afghanistan's first women's magazine was founded by the Oxford-educated queen, Soraya Tarsi, which I will be talking about in a second. In the 1950s, gender segregation was abolished, and by the 1960s, women were becoming more active in civil society. Women helped draft Afghanistan's third constitution and gained the, vote, uh, the right to vote, the right for education, and the freedom to work. In the 1965, Afghans elected four women representatives, representatives to parliament, one of whom served as Afghanistan's first vice president in the 1980s. All of this era is known as the golden age for women. Up until the, the early 90s, women were teachers, government workers, and medical doctors. Unfortunately, after the Taliban's rise to power, women and girls were systematically discriminated against and marginalized, and their human rights were violated. Uh, today, uh, the place of women in society uh, has improved in some areas of, of the country, and um, the First Lady Rula Ghani inaugurates, um, uh, inaugurates the first uh, um, um, university for women and is pushing to empower women in all aspects of society. Next, please. As I mentioned in the beginning of the timeline, uh, the Queen Soraya Tarsi was Afghanistan first lady from 1919 to 1926, and it remains a symbol of the modern Afghan woman till this day. Born into a family of Afghan intellectuals and educated in Syria, she founded the Afghanistan first school of girls and published the country's first magazine for women. As the face of many modernizing reforms during Amanullah's regime, Queen Soraya became one of the most influential women in Afghanistan and encouraged women to become active participants in national building, like you can see from her quote. She contributed to the rising status of women in Afghanistan in various ways during her rule. Her powerful vision played the, paved the way for progressive Afghanistan through most of the 20th century. Next. This is, these are some pictures of what this golden age that I was talking about looked like. This is the campus of Kabul University, where you can see women um, being you know, uh, half or even more than half of the population and being well integrated. Next, please. Today, things are uh, very different. And uh, since we couldn't uh, go to Afghanistan to take a look at ourselves and research ourselves, um, we relied on a series of photo essays taken by the great uh, photographer Kiana Hayeri. We also did surveys uh, to 30 or plus women in all aspects of society, activists, educators, um, and, and more. And we interviewed um, um, almost 100 people in every city that we studied. With all of this information and with the photos, and you know, we, we were able to understand uh, how women um, exercise in the city, where, how do women uh, come together, um, how do they get educated, uh, they, how they socialize, and, and more. Next, please. With all this research uh, in, in, our, in our hands, uh, we divided in the research into four focus areas, education, healthcare, uh, economic development, and accessibility. Because uh, we believe that given the opportunity, women will become key catalysts for innovation and economic growth, uh, and leaders in their neighborhoods regeneration and anchors in their communities. Next, please. So I'll go one by one. Um, in the education uh, area, um, as you all know, uh, education is an essential part of providing access to opportunity. Too often, however, girls in Afghanistan are not given the same access to school and training. This lack of education stems from several causes, including the inability to move freely around the city, a lack of emphasis on female education in schools, and a lack of facilities for women. Uh, from what you can see from this chart, um, women represent, uh, are better represented in primary and secondary school and high school, However, when it comes to higher education and technical uh, vocational training, they are uh, very bad uh, represented, even though uh, women in general represent almost 50% of the population uh, in Afghanistan today. So there's a clear gap in access to education, especially in rural cities. Next. Literacy levels in all five cities uh, also the, uh, um, tell us a, a similar story where Kandahar, Jalalabad, and Kost um, really suffer from literacy levels, while Mazar and Herat 
are a little bit better in terms of women versus men. Next. And in higher education, um, you know, some of the cities are overcoming uh, this challenge. As you can see, Mazar and Sharif and Herat are almost 50-50 when it comes to uh, women attendance. Uh, but cities like Jalalabad, Kandahar, and Khost are really, um, there's a really a gap in, in you know, attendance uh, from women, as you can see from the charts. Next. Um, regarding healthcare and wellness, um, you know, healthcare and wellness is a cornerstone of any woman quality of life. Uh, given the volatility of recent decades, medical care and mental support uh, services are highly needed in Afghanistan. These issues are further exacerbated by limitations placed on women's accessibility to healthcare and recreational facilities. Um, therefore, as you can see from this chart, um, the, most of women uh, give birth at home, 90%, which is uh, very risky. Next. Also, uh, access to uh, clinics is uh, even more challenging for displaced women uh, and IDPs. Next, please. Regarding economy, women represent a significant untapped potential co to contribute to Kabul's economy. While an increasing amount of women are contributing to household incomes, only 20% of women in Afghanistan are in the workforce. Inter interviews reveal to us the need for women employees in sectors such as medicine, engineering, and education. However, access to training and facilities inhibits women's uh, economic mobility. Key barriers to economic opportunities include basic infrastructure, training, and access to credit. High living costs, particularly housing and transportation, create significant barriers for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and savings. The creation of jobs in all sectors of society um, will empower entrepreneurs and small businesses and will create not only a better quality for women's life, but it also will be a necessary step to improving the country's economy, bringing it to the 21st economy. Next. And uh, lastly, uh, safety uh, and accessibility to the public realm uh, is critical for urban quality of life. It ensures access to amenities, promotes social cohesion, and allows economic activity to thrive. Today, um, the cities in Afghanistan public realm can be a difficult place for women. Uh, interviews and additional research yield frequent complaints of physical and verbal harassment. This sense of perceived vulnerability can restrict the movement around the city and participation in professional, social, and cultural activities. Next, please. You know, it's important to promote a gender inclusive public realm. Uh, right now, um, you see all parks and plazas uh, mostly filled with men. Next. And an important part of Afghan society is the spaces for worship, which women are not allowed in inside the buildings. Next. We also took a look at city initiatives that are already um, doing some efforts uh, to change this reality in Afghanistan, um, you know, like uh, groups for athletic, athletic programming, public art, economic empowerment, uh, performances, um, street names dedicated to women, awareness campaigns um, that we also researched next. And with all that in mind, we created uh, design concepts and toolkits for urban for three different uh, areas: urban amenities, open spaces, and mobilities. And the idea of um, you know of all of these strategies in general was to create dedicated spaces for women. And this idea is not new; it comes from the traditional concept of the sanana, which refers to spaces reserved for women and managed by women. Um, as Kabul evolves, these are opportunities. There are opportunities to implement this concept of dedicated spaces, and you know, in the future, uh, this could also be incorporated into the larger spaces of the city. Next, so I'm going to talk about uh, quickly about these three uh, toolkits um, for the parks and open space. Um, you know, as we all know, Kabul should develop a culture and network of parks and open spaces where women and families feel comfortable. In but today, uh, protected and demarcated areas for women is also a key need to make parks accessible. In order to incorporate the immediate need, um, parks should include similar, uh, some smaller spaces, uh, like I was talking about before, or rooms, as you can see here from, from this diagram, inspired by traditional gardens, uh, where the boundaries and entrances of these rooms can be combined to create spaces that feel very intimate and protected while also remaining 
connected to the larger parks and surroundings. Uh, these spaces will provide all types of programs, uh, you know, the same that are provided in the rest of the parks. And uh, in the toolkit, this approach of the toolkit is, is the idea is to create generic solutions that can be um, incorporated into, into different parks and open spaces of the city. Like, for example, integrating the entrance to a park uh, within a community center or simply provide a guard allows access to be safer. Uh, well-lit spaces, discreetly uh, located in like emergency boxes. Um, design should be compared ramps, seating, signage, bathrooms, water, um, to ensure access to all women. And finally, defining edges with trees, screens, and lanterns to create secure private spaces without creating a feeling of confinement. Next. In terms of mobility, uh, the country rapid growth and the accompanying congestion has made transportation a significant challenge across the city. And particularly for women, uh, is, is more vulnerable. Uh, women is very vulnerable to crime and violence uh, in the public transportation and or in the streets. The lack of safe and adequate transportation reduces the amount of trips women make, limiting their access to opportunities in many parts of the city and decreasing their ability to earn income. Next, please. Uh, mobility, in the mobility toolkit, I'm, I'm, I'm about to be done. Um, you know, we, we all, the different strategies that were, that were uh, designed for the urban design framework, um, we incorporated spaces for women in the buses or uh, while they wait for, for the bus, mini buses, uh, mini buses uh, operated by women, for women and dedicated taxi spaces. Next. And lastly, um, we design a network of women centers uh, that could provide basic services like clinics and daycare, as well as opportunities for arts, culture, and education uh, that can be tapped into the existing infrastructure of the city. Uh, and some of the toolkits uh, range from public to private, like for example, um, pavilions in, pa in public parks, uh, pavilions in school parcels, or um, the reuse of the school classrooms in the weekends and at night. Um, also to all the way to private, uh, to the creation of uh, recreation spaces and rooftops where women can feel safe, or just ground floors of commercial buildings, um, of office buildings where there could be like daycare uh, for women to, you know, to be allowed to, to work. Next. And this is my last image. Um, you know, all of these toolkits were that were generic, uh, well contextualized in each of the cities. And this is, for example, a woman center in Kandahar. Um, that was uh, quite private uh, to the street, but the interior was completely open, providing open spaces that felt safe, spaces for education, um, for the creation of arts and crafts. Um, and it's, it's very well articulated with the mosque and the plaza uh, of the mosque. Um, just want to end up by saying that the entire section uh, was done in blue, just to emphasize the garments of women. And just to give uh, this piece of the section um, like a, like a you know a difference in color, and we were very deliberate in putting women in all of the renders and perspectives, just to change the collective imaginary and to provide a vision for for you know for a better future. Thank you. The next one is culture and society. Victor will speak about it. Uh, sorry, I was trying to. Um unmute my phone and I advanced the slides. Ali Khan, could you go back to the sort of first slide, please? Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Einat. Um, I am the, the last presenter of the Sasaki group. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief, actually for the purpose of time, because I think we're a bit behind schedule, um, on sort of culture and society and how uh, this impacts how we intervene in the built environment, particularly in the context of uh, these five um, cities. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I think this, um, uh, my colleague Ali Khan has touched upon this before. Um, you know, Afghanistan has always been seen uh, by us as this crossroads of civilizations, all these different layers, um, you know, uh, create a very rich cultural environment. Uh, it is definitely not a very, it's not a monolithic uh, cultural environment. It's very diverse, depending on region, depending on the cities, and depending obviously on uh, the neighboring countries, all these sort of cultural forces um, are huge driving elements 
uh, in each of the cities that we've uh, worked on in Kabul and the five provincial capitals. Um, next slide. Um, we um, worked very closely with partners to um, establish a major inventory of um, cultural and heritage sites in all of these cities. Um, this um, working with you know partners like the Aga Khan uh, Development Network, um, local partners on the ground, um, and um, a lot of our work in these cities when it relates to just these sort of culture and heritage sites was to sort of increase access, expand access uh, to some of these remarkable places. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think another uh, important aspect of our work is really sort of understand not um, only specific sites as um, uh, heritage and cultural sites, but also cities as an expression of culture. This is a photo of um, uh, Kabul. Um, and and uh, in the beginning of our work um, uh, in Afghanistan, um, we sort of tried to sort of challenge the bias around uh, you know, informality and organic development um, uh, and without um, necessarily romanticizing it, but thinking that these are um, uh, very culturally rich um, urban areas that require investment um, and um, um, to improve quality of life of residents. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, uh, because of migration and also because of, you know, just the local culture, um, a lot of the cities that we've um, um, been working on in Afghanistan are very dense uh, human settlements. Uh, this means that they're very complex uh, to intervene upon. It also means that you have all these different layers of heritage, culture, uh, mobility, uh, all um, on top of each other. Um, and um, it, um, if you go to the next slide, um, um, as an example, this is Herat. Richness of fabric that you see in the historic core, you know, um, uh, where you know you have uh, uh, very tight knit uh, coexisting with um, markets, with cultural sites, uh, archaeological sites that are um, uh, need to be protected. That are very vulnerable. Um, and um, if you go to the next slide, we'll just see some images of of um, these heritage sites that are, you know. Um, uh, a testament of the importance of Afghanistan's in the sort of uh, trade routes. Uh, this is the sort of citadel of uh, Herat, uh, a beautiful structure. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, some of these sort of heritage sites are, you know, uh, uh, populated by retail. They um, um, uh, need to be sort of protected, but also leveraged as key assets uh, in very dense uh, living quarters. No? Um, if you go to the next slide. This is another remarkable heritage site uh, in Herat, um, the Masjid Jam. Um, and um, um, these, so sometimes these beautiful sites lack um, access. Um, and our work, um, if you go to the next slide, um, looking at some of these um, um, uh, heritage areas was to uh, engage with our local partners, look at previous studies, and um, integrate a lot of existing initiatives into a framework uh, that establishes um, key interventions, uh, particularly in the public realm, um, that um, focus on providing basic infrastructure, um, allowing um, existing uh, commercial establishments to invest uh, in their properties, um, and also make these neighborhoods more resilient um, um, and livable. Uh, in the future. So uh, the next slide. Um, as an example, this is um, a site that we identified right next to the citadel, uh, a very small um, open space um, where a visitor center um, can provide um, bathrooms, um, facilities uh, for women, um, and can be a, cat a catalyst uh, for uh, revitalization, not only of, of um, um, these historic assets, but also a sort of a community regeneration factor uh, as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, beyond the um, uh, old city um, and all of these cities that we've um, um, addressed um, have a very sort of um, strong historic core. Um, these are also cities that are growing quite rapidly. Uh, in the case of Herat, 
pictured here. Uh, it's a city that is going to grow by 1 million uh, inhabitants in the next 20 years. So um, a lot of our work is um, really focused on how do you sort of structure that expansion? How do you, uh, based on a lot of the uh, landscape analysis that my colleague Thomas uh, presented, is how do you sort of protect critical ecological assets, uh, direct growth and coordinate this growth um, with um, mobility and infrastructure uh, to create resilient communities. Now, so you'll see in this uh, map areas of protection, a sort of um, focus on a corridor to the north uh, with the introduction of uh, bus rapid transit lines and uh, trying to push growth towards the west um, of Herat um, where we established a series of toolkits uh, for neighborhood upgrades, uh, but also um, toolkits to um, create a framework uh, that will sort of transition um, what are uh, currently agricultural plots uh, to um, sustainable, resilient communities in the future. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is a view of um, Western uh, Herat. This is an area that we um, uh, focused on as a pilot area. Um, you'll see this is just um, showcasing some of the um, toolkits that I've mentioned around upgrading and around structuring. You'll see um, the establishment of community spines that are based on existing roads. So uh, trying to stay away from um, very invasive and aggressive um, uh, infrastructure uh, investments, but rather really working with the existing city and the existing fabric. Um, making sure that as the city expands uh, to the west, um, that we integrate um, critical uh, social infrastructure, new anchors um, um, that will support that growth. So in this case, uh, investments in the, in the Herat University um, and in training facilities um, and working with uh, our stakeholders to understand what are the um, future uses that the city needs, such as convention and exhibition areas that strengthen that urban uh, rural synergies that my colleague Ali Khan was um, mentioning as well. You'll see highlighted uh, right at the center of this image, uh, the Musala Minarets, uh, the archeological complex. Uh, that is also a um, very important um, archeological site uh, in Herat that is very vulnerable. Uh, and it's next to a sort of pilot neighborhood, the Char Sunak um, neighborhood um, that we've um, went into a bit more detail to test um, these toolkits around um, neighborhood upgrade and protection of um, heritage uh, sites. So the next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an image of um, this district. Uh, you'll see the minarets towards the back and um, um, some of the hustle and bustle that is associated um, with um, this area of Herat in the foreground. Um, uh, next slide, please. And um, one thing that I think is critical to understand just uh, culturally in Afghanistan is um, as we started to work with these pilot projects is the importance of the Gozars. No? Uh, Gozars, which are um, units of local governance. Um, they usually are composed of uh, around a thousand households um, and they are um, led by a wakil, which is a community leader, uh, usually someone who is very <coughs> respected in the community. So when we started to work on these pilots, we made sure to respect some of the physical boundaries um, of these uh, Gozars um, so that they can be partners in the implementation of some of these projects. These are projects that are very sensitive to the context. Um, <coughs> they um, uh, establish some of these community spines and some of the community amenities um, that sort of support growth and investment uh, in these neighborhoods. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this is an example of a public space <clears throat> and one of these interventions in Charsonuk um, where <clears throat> we are integrating um, affordable housing, um, community facilities and public space uh, with a bold vision that really looks into the future um, <clears throat> and, and seeks to create a very resilient livable community. Um, beyond the urban centers, um, um, we also um, focused on expanding access to cultural sites um, in the larger city regions um, of the five cities, uh, 
we um, addressed. So this is in Kandahar, which is in southwest Afghanistan. Um, um, and um, it, focusing on the um, Wali Baba Shrine, which is a very important um, shrine in Kandahar that today um, um, is very popular, attracts um, um, uh, a lot of visitors, but lacks the infrastructure um, to sort of receive um, these visitors. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just a view of this, this shrine and, uh, and how popular it is. Um, and part of our work, if you go to the next slide, um, was to really sort of establish, um, you know, a pr preservation economy around some of these um, heritage sites. Um, looking at, you know, uh, uh, regenerating landscape, cultural landscapes, um, adding facilities, visitor centers, um, and sort of trying to sort of leverage these as, uh, as future employment hubs uh, to support a uh, heritage livelihood um, in, in Kandahar. Next slide, please. Um, another important aspect of, um, um, of intervening in the built environment is really understanding um, you know, vulnerability and um, the importance of social infrastructure. This is the Eidga Leaf community in Kandahar. Um, uh, this is an area that is um, in high risk of flooding. Um, and we sort of focused on this area because we wanted to reconnect um, this to the fabric um, and uh, improve uh, livability um, in general uh, for um, people in this area. Uh, this is just a, um, um, a view of the um, of this uh, neighborhood, you'll see a very challenging um, environments to operate in. Um, um, a lot of areas that are already privatized, uh, very small um, open spaces or public spaces that um, as urban designers, um, we can sort of directly shape. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so um, I think as a focus, I mean, one thing that we um, try to do in all of our proposals, particularly in neighborhood regeneration and adopting some of these um, toolkits that I described earlier is uh, really investing uh, in the public space no? um, and trying to connect um, the community to either existing facilities or new facilities that are being proposed. So you'll see at the center of this image, um, a sort of um, a large open space that is public but underutilized um, and can serve as a connector from the community to the university um, in the West uh, to a new urban corridor tied to transit, uh, the Uros Gun Road uh, to the east. So if you go to the next slide. So in this case, um, in this neighborhood, we propose a series of catalytic investments, uh, particularly in the public realm um, around um, new community facilities, um, mosques, markets, um, um, investments in infrastructure to prevent uh, flooding. Um, and also to improve connectivity to uh, jobs along the Uruzurgan road uh, back to the city core. And if you go to the next slide, um, and I think a, a great lesson, and you'll recognize this image from what uh, Einat was um, proposing uh, and uh, discussing uh, before me, is this notion of integration, you know, of thinking about how um, uh, you know, your intervention can be bigger than the sum of its parts. You know? So you'll see here, you know, um, investments in the public realm with plazas, a woman's center to empower women and, and give them economic opportunity. Um, neighborhood markets, also affordable housing. Um, and this idea of even integrating affordable housing with facilities that can potentially serve the surrounding neighborhoods as well and that can be managed by the community. So um, with that, I believe um, we end our presentation and thanks everyone for, for listening in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Victor. Thanks to the Sasaki team. Thank you, Ono. That was really fascinating. I know Ono has another commitment. So I'm gonna kind of just jump into a question for him. Uh, and then I'd like to address some questions to the Sasaki group. There were questions on the chat, which kind of got answered. There were some for Ono and data and, other clarifications, so uh, I don't need to repeat any of those. But you know, Ono, uh, uh, 
uh, it was interesting. Uh, Sasaki has, of course, as part of their mandate, rightly so, focused on these five towns. And I have a number of questions there, which I'll get to, to the Sasaki team. But you know, it in the context of our studio, in the context of I know what uh, your agency is aiming at. Uh, you know, I think the discussion on Afghanistan, but actually by extension, the discussion for most parts of South Asia about what even the urban and rural as a binary and a divide mean today is an interesting question. Of course, I think there were very interesting graphics about the attraction of the main big cities. Uh, but, you know, for example, the area we're looking at uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan is a 15,000 person town with a network of 20 uh, villages. And so uh, the addressal of the urban rural divide and a kind of imagination for it is also going to become part of the future. And I understand that's something you guys are concerned with. So I would love to hear your thoughts uh, on that. Thanks, Rahul. Thanks very much. Um, you know, when I was uh, country director for India for the World Bank, um, I, I talked a lot about urbanization and how it was such an important phenomenon in India. And I actually had a story about little Rahul. I, I'm not making that name up. That's the name I used. It was, of course, a little play on a famous politician by that name. And um, lit, uh, little Rahul was, uh, was a young guy who got married. He was somewhere in a village in UP and he moved to the city and he went on his own, left his wife behind and struggled to make a life and two years later he called his wife and he said I've made it I now got a job it was a big job but it, he could afford to have his wife he said come to the city and his wife said I don't need to do that the city has already come to the village <laughs> and, and 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 this is a really important story because people think urbanization is people moving to Bombay and Delhi and Kabul and and and, and Karachi and places like that much of urbanization is simply um, congregation and a Agglomeration at the peri-urban level, town, uh, the villages becoming towns, towns becoming census towns, census towns becoming uh, becoming um, uh, cities, etc. So, so that's the first thing: is that the rural-urban divide significantly is uh, a fading concept. It's of course not a totally fading concept when you talk about high mountain villages. Now, and, and that's in, interesting because many people ask me, how can you have an agency that focuses a lot on mountains and mountain communities and then does the rest of its work literally in Kabul, Karachi, Bombay and places like that? And um, to me, there's, there's two answers to that. One is, there is actually something that is very similar to, to a mountain village and a big city. And it is the scarcity of good habitable land. Because uh, contrary to what you think when you see a mountain area, which looks very spacious, there's actually precious little land you can use for habitat and built environment purposes because of the, the, the ruggedness of the environment. And therefore, one needs to be very economical and thoughtful about how to use space, which makes planning important. Now, the second is really is Heinz Dierkan's vision, which is he then says, well, if we have the same problem, why should we be less ambitious about how we are efficient in villages than we are in cities? It just doesn't make any conceptual sense. Why shouldn't we invest in using planning techniques in communities where that previously wasn't the case and all you had was uh, essentially the kind of development that people did on their own, not thinking about where to build so that you get organic growth and, and not always efficient outcomes and very often high risk exposure. So that's the challenge of the work we do. It's quite a deliberate attempt to work in both places, but then to transport the knowledge from the work in the high end cities where you can do fancy work, um, fantastic work and great work from the Sasaki team. They're looking at all the aspects we're trying to look at. It's really impressive, but why not then use that in uh, a small community that needs to relocate because it's in a hazardous spot and do good design and planning for them. And, and, and that's therefore our ambition. Our ambition is frankly, to bridge that rural urban divide. So I hope that's a bit uh, of a helpful perspective. I, I'm, my other commitment is I need to cook for my daughter. Um, uh, <laughs> given her age, I can't ask her to, uh, to, to, to wait uh, with her food. So, so I'm gonna sign off, but thank you so much for having me and, and great, great work from the Sasaki team. I was very impressed. 
Thank you, Ono. Thank you very much. And I'm going to actually pick up on the point that Ono sort of made about these sort of regions. And I think one of the things in the Sasaki plan that is, is, is quite unusual and brilliant in some ways is, is the fact that you have that whole section on landscape ecology and in identifying the export import imbalance, your emphasis uh, on agriculture, your emphasis on fruit and you know, adding value through growing, uh, which is already something that's happening in Afghanistan, opens up that discussion also in terms of creating this urban and rural uh, divide. So I think that dimension in your plan, in a sense, makes that bridge to what Ono is talking about. The other thing that was very interesting, and these are two observations before I ask a question or two, is, uh, you know, you, uh, including the last one where we talked about heritage, you emphasize, Dennis, these were strategic plans, frameworks, but you also Im implied and emphasized really that they were integrative plans, which means whether it was uh, recognizing uh, the Gozans and the Vakil uh, as the leader of the Gozans and integrating uh, spatially uh, the, those communities, uh, but also recognizing other projects that governments might have in place and making them part of givens almost in your plan makes the plan also integrative, which is of course linked then to the question of implementation. And I hope we'll have another forum where we can discuss some of those questions because right now you're at the stage where you've made these frameworks and it would be interesting from your experience, but also in our discussion for the studio to talk about what it means uh, for implementation. Uh, and so I think that was also something that struck me as a very robust kind of approach. The two questions that I, I have, and I'll put both the questions and you can decide how you want to feel them. Uh, one is it's, it, it's really striking that the five towns that you did and what we are looking at as a town are all border towns. So therefore the growth of urbanism has occurred across along the borders really of Afghanistan. And I think the, the ring road will accelerate it as that gets its improvements. Border towns are interesting places because they're drawing internally, uh, whether it's from the countryside or distributing wealth and resources and capital within, but they're also dealing with an externality, which is the border and what's outside the border and, and how it is regulated. And so I was just sort of on that question, uh, I was wondering if you had thoughts um, uh, about what those challenges would be, because I think the town that we're looking at is exactly the same kind of uh, situation. I mean, are you talking about, you know, uh, border posts, which have to do with security and regulation? Uh, are they to do with flows and markets, which become moments and nodes of exchange and allow a kind of porosity and osmosis with what's outside and what's inside? I was wondering if there was any discussion and imagination around that. The second question I had, and, and yet you kind of brought it up when you talked about how you all purposefully even represented women in the renderings just to shift the imagination, right? And so I was also struck besides the fact that you had a lot of birds in your rendering and I texted Dennis about that to check why that was the case because in every real image you showed me, I saw no birds, but that's just a part, just a joke. Uh, but I think like the way you rendered women uh, to change that imagination. I also noticed that you rendered a lot of informal economy, uh, perhaps to also change that imagination. And in one or two slides, I noticed a pop-up market in the background. So the renderings of uh, for the women, you explained to us how you were going to integrate them in society. But I didn't hear about the marketplaces, the informal uh, transactions that appeared in the images, were, were they purposefully built into the design strategy too? So those are the two questions I had. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'd, I'll let uh, Ali Khan and, and maybe Thomas talk about the, the border issue. You know, in the time of the pandemic, this border issue is really significant because people are leaving and uh, uh, coming into the country in, in ways that uh, are a bit unpredictable and have an impact, but uh, the border uh, locations also present huge opportunities, I think, for these uh, cities. Ali Khan, do you want to pick up on some of that? And then maybe Victor and Arnott on the second question. Sure. Um, it, is, it is a really interesting point um, about the sort of 
the impact of being close to a border, especially for a small town where, you know, most um, smaller towns and villages, um, you have a sort of that isolation also comes with a sense of agency. Um, and so while there may be negatives, a positive is that you can operate in a, in a, in a closed loop and you can have agency over your domain. And I think that being a border town, being the site of much larger infrastructures and flows, whether it's politics, commerce, that presents a tremendous opportunity for growth um, to leverage those um, assets and opportunities. But it also means that um, as a resident, as a local official, um, as, a, as any stakeholder, um, you do have to navigate those and to make sure that, um, you know, on the one hand, um, you can um, keep your your distance or 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 access it, and I think some of our some of our work on both of these projects, as well as on um, I think some ongoing communications we've had, um, that that sort of institutional um, disconnect is is not just in Afghanistan but all over the world um, an issue, and so I would in, encourage. Um, um, the students, but anyone who's working in this kind of context to really think about um, how um, both physically and spatially and institutionally, how do the sort of small villages and towns interact with these large infrastructures? Um, are they isolated? Are there negative externalities? Are there impacts? And also what are the common, um, the sort of common things that, that both of them need that you can sort of build constituencies around, right? So. Uh, whether it's a border crossing post or a small village, um, resilience and risk is very important, right? Um, and so that is a point of commonality. So finding finding places where whatever scale you you are, um, whatever your reason for being in this location is, um, there is a common goal to build around um, and then pulling resources. Um, so uh, I'll turn it over to, to Thomas now. Maybe an additional thought um, for the studio to think about is too, is like when we think of the system again, sort of going back to the idea of the system is then, you know, it's like 80% of uh, the workforce today is in agriculture. And that's my shift in the long-term future, but the near-term reality is still that agricultural livelihoods are sort of front and center. And so the question then goes back to uh, the idea of uh, value chains and this issue of Afghanistan importing much more even from their basic dietary products like flour and so on to this question of what can be done in terms of agro processing whether this is you know like a primary processing where it's about de-husking where it's about the uh, notion of producing products that can be bought within the country with sort of the currency and the the, the, the financial strengths that they have and then be sort of what kinds of processing could you do um, to then strengthen international markets? When you look much more broadly into what is being produced around, Afghanistan does not have the capacity like, uh, you know, water-rich Pakistan or what's uh, some of the things that are happening in Iran and other places. But then how could you position Afghanistan in a way uh, in a specific value chain that starts to leverage some of the things that do really grow well. For example, we have in Herat, I think um, we have saffron, one of the, the things that uh, are really thriving and it provides a market for women to enter the labor force. It is also an opportunity to then uh, really uh, shift the, uh, the, 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 the story from let's say producing opium. Uh, we haven't talked about opium and it's something that is sort of this, this rabbit hole that you might be entering into, but it's also a, a means to an end to say like, look, if you're providing alternative agricultural products that can be processed in a way that, you know, like is good for national products, but also for the exports, then the system again, from the town to sort of your outpost or you do your, to your border town where perhaps some of, not only some of the processing happens, but the sort of this, this, this chain, this um, system can really uh, start to catalyze the agricultural economy and lift up the, the majority of, of our agricultural labor force is, is an important step, I think. Thank you, no, no, that, and therefore 
But I think the implication of that would be then how more mindfully one makes the spaces for that to happen, correct? And I think that's part of what there were indications. And I mean, I know we can have a whole discussion uh, about this in detail. I uh, just to end, you know, there was a question that did surface up from the chat, but a question and a comment, which was about implementation, because one had mentioned it. And the question was, you know, how much can we rely on municipalities and local level for the implementation or what might be complex and ambitious plans? And I think that's not an answer one can have. And I think that's why it's so interesting what is happening in a place like Afghanistan very quickly, where multiple agencies, both from externally and internally, uh, coming are coming together and the government is being very proactive about this. And I think to watch how this coalesces into implementation uh, and hits the ground would be really an interesting thing to observe. And hopefully, you know, we're going to do two more sessions. Maybe we'll dedicate in the last session a little longer time where we can have much more of a broader discussion, picking up on some of these issues. And we do hope all of you will attend some of these. The next one will be really looking at traditional architecture and urbanism. And my colleague, Charlotte, uh, will um, moderate that and uh, and you know we'd be really happy if many of you join us again so with that I really want to thank the Sasaki group for sharing this wonderful work that you've done over these many years and sharing it so generously I hope we can involve you in more discussions through the semester in the studio and that you would participate in also these public forums it would enrich it uh, considerably so thanks very much thank you all Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks everyone.